Thank you. Just a, sorry, just okay. uh, so uh, Councillor's happy to take questions during the talk, so uh, feel feel free to raise your hand. There will be another opportunity at the end of it, and yeah. then I'll be going around the microphone. Okay. Thank you very much, Tristan. Uh, I'm very glad to be here this week, and uh, although my field is quite different from quantum science, but uh, recently, oh sorry, uh, some of the waveguides are used for quantum experiments, so I will relate our field to, the, to your field. And anyway, I will describe the uh, evolution of uh, optical fiber communication systems which is currently used fiber to the home. Uh, you are using fiber to the home system. And WDM system, wavelength division multiplexing system, which is currently broadly used for metro, long haul, and submarine uh, optical fiber systems. And also, currently 4G mobile you are using. And next is the 5G. Probably we can enjoy almost one gigabit downstream in near future. And also, as you know, data center drives everything. And in our field, the information increases uh, super exponentially due to the uh, 5G, 4G, 5G, and data center applications. So I will describe very briefly this. And also, I will describe uh, various kinds of waveguides, which is, of course, used for telecom data com applications. But uh, some of these start to be used for quantum uh, applications. So let me start uh, the optical fibers. What's going on in current optical fiber? So this is the preform. Uh, the diameter is almost 12 centimeters, and length is almost 50 centimeters. And you you see clearly uh, clearly here there is a core which confines the light. Uh, and the surrounding medium is the cladding, which is com composed of pure silica uh, glass. And in order to increase the refractive index of the core, uh, typical material is the germanium dioxide. This increases the refractive index of the silica uh, glass. And uh, this preform is put into the uh, furnace the temperature is raised to almost 2,000 degrees C. And uh, uh, silica glass start to melt around 1,300 degrees Celsius. So as you see, the, uh, it can be elongated, uh, as you see here, down to 125 micron. This is the standard diameter of the optical fiber. So it, its elongation is almost 1 million times. So even if there is a, a core diameter irregularity in the preform stage, it is elongated uh, one million times. So it's almost perfectly smooth in the optical fibers. So that's the key of the low loss of optical fibers. The current uh, optical fiber attenuation is 0.14 dB per kilometer. So over one kilometer, the uh, radiation loss or absorption loss in total is just 3%. And 20 dB is uh, uh, one uh, typical value for which needs amplification, electronically or, or optically. So after uh, passing through 140 kilometer, uh, light beam signal should be uh, amplified. Currently, optical amplifier which uses erbium doped fiber. So that can directly amplify the signal. So optical degeneration is uh, done after four times the optical ampli amplification. That means after 400 kilometer, uh, light wave signal is translated in electrical signal and amplified and reshaped again. and then excite the uh, laser diode and transmit uh, another 400 kilometers. That's the current light wave systems. And the, uh, in the optical fibers, those are new topic, uh, although it's a rather old, uh, date back old days. Uh, one is the so-called uh, cobweb fiber people calls 
uh, that uh, silica core fiber in the air. So this region just supports the silica core, no other functionality here. And in order to make the single mode uh, fiber, uh, because the refractive index difference here is 1.45 and the surrounding medium is air, N equals one. So core should be very small in order to achieve the single mode condition. So it's a submicron core. And when you couple the intense light, laser light, uh, every kind of uh, nonlinearity, optical car effect, brilliant effect, Dama effect takes place, I, I will show later. And right hand side, it's called the photonic crystal fiber. Crystal means the cladding region is the Bragg grating, two dimensional Bragg grating. So oh, for certain band, for example, 1.4 to 1.55 micron wavelength range, this region acts as the Bragg reflector. So even if the core is air, uh, light beam cannot radiate out because it's reflected back, confined by the Bragg grating. So it's called the photonic crystal fibers. And this, this one is actually not the photonic crystal fiber, the uh, so-called uh, uh, silica core embedded uh, air uh, cobweb fiber was used in this experiment. And light sources, this was done by ORC Southampton University. Uh, light source is one micron wavelengths. And when you couple the strong laser light, uh, various kinds of nonlinear effect takes place and the chain effect by, through the chain effect of nonlinearity, the spectrum broadens. So it is co called as uh, the supercontinuum. So from visible to infrared uh, light can be generated, as you see here. So this is quite important for various kinds of applications. Uh, of course, it can be a white light source for spectroscopy. And also, uh, it, it, when we can generate octave different spectrum source, uh, it can serve for the optical clock by stabilizing the laser. So I will not go into detail here. The requirement for the fiber is a very small core and also the dispersion at the pumping wavelengths should be zero or minimum in order to enhance the nonlinear effect. And next, uh, I'd like to describe the optical Fiber fuse, uh, I'm not sure, oh, so it's not connected, uh, unfortunately. So fiber fuse is the, uh, sorry, it, it, it's not connected to the network now. So hope, uh, I, I hope <laughs> later on I will describe. Uh, so fiber fuse is the, when we couple very intense light, oh, sorry. for example, uh, roughly one watt power into optical fiber, the discharge takes place in the dielectric glass material and the discharge propagates normally from the output end side to source side. So that's, that is called optical fiber fuse and then it makes the void inside the core region. So attenuation becomes uh, very large. So optical fiber cannot be used further. And that limit is typically one watt. And in, in this example, I, want, I wanted to show is the researchers uh, coupled nine watt. So optical fuse effect easily took place. And for example, uh, in the current WDM systems, we have almost 100 channels. So if the, uh, each channel uh, signal light intensity is 10 milliwatt, it reaches one watt and the optical fiber fuse takes place. So we cannot couple uh, 10 milliwatt 
in 100 channel systems. Typical uh, intensity, I think, is two or three milliwatt. But anyway, uh, we cannot increase the WDM channel number uh, 200 channels or 1,000 channels because of the nonlinear effect takes place and also optical fiber fuels damages the fiber. So this is the limit of the number of channels in WDM systems. Okay, so I will go to the optical waveguides. Optical waveguides, this is a cross section of optical waveguides. Uh, it's quite similar to optical fibers, core which has uh, dope to increase the refractive index and surrounded by the cladding. And we normally use silicon as a substrate because it is uh, rather cheap. And uh, we should separate the light field from silicon substrate because the refractive index of silicon is quite high. So if this is close to the silicon substrate, light field goes out to the substrate. So uh, typically in this, our silica waveguides, the typical thickness of this region is 15 micron. And so far, the attenuation of the waveguide, uh, what we got in the past is 1.7 dB per meter. Uh, that is when we compare to optical fibers. Optical fiber is 10 to the minus 4 dB per meter. So uh, 10,000 times higher loss this is the even lowest uh, loss of wave, uh, planar waveguide loss. And in order to measure the loss precisely, we should anyway make very long uh, waveguides. As you see here, we made 10 meter long waveguide in the past and uh, coupling argon blue light, it goes counterclockwise uh, initially and goes opposite clockwise direction and goes out here. And if we, I will describe more data on silicon photonics. The silicon wire waveguide loss is typically one dB per centimeter, which is 100 times larger than silica. So uh, advantage of silicon are manifold, uh, I will describe later on, but the loss is uh, very high compared to silica waveguides. And this shows very roughly the current uh, network. And what I would like to stress is that this uh, currently 4G mobile wireless system is uh, backed up by optical fiber systems. And for future wireless networks, uh, there are many applications, automated cruise control, and also sensors communicate to each other and uh, signal or sense to signal uh, goes up to the network. So this wireless system uh, contributes to increase the traffic more and more. And also, as you know, uh, you are daily using the YouTube or Instagram or many applications and it increases the net traffic very rapidly. So data center application, uh, data center absorbs the so many traffic, required so many traffic. So uh, in the past, telecom uh, uh, network dominated in the older days, but currently these wireless and data center application dominates. Okay, so I, I will describe what is the array waveguide grating we call AWG. This is the uh, schematic configuration of the AWG, which is implemented in silica waveguides, for example. And when WDM signal comes in to the waveguide, uh, it reaches to the so-called slab region. Slab region, the cross section is something like this. There is no lateral confinement and light is only vertically confined. So it can freely radiate along the uh, lateral direction and excites uh, many arrayed waveguide. Waveguide arrays are waiting here. 
So excite many array waveguide here. So in the commercial uh, device of AWG, we have almost 100 or 200 waveguide arrays, which has fixed pass length difference, typically uh, 30 micron or 50 micron fixed pass length difference. And then after traveling through the array waveguide, uh, each spectral component has their own uh, phase front, a cumulative phase front, as you see here. Uh, generally speaking, a shorter wavelength component tilting like this, and longer wavelength component tilts something like this. And uh, many arrayed waveguides emit the radiation, and only certain point it constructively interferes. So we observe the output spot here and goes out certain output waveguides. So uh, this uh, AWG automatically demultiplexes the uh, WDM signal. In the current WDM system, the channel spacing is uh, 100 gigahertz at 1.55 micron region. That is uh, 0 0.8 nanometer uh, channel spacing and uh, maximum almost uh, 100 channels is commercially utilized based on this uh, AWG. And when you couple oppositely different wavelength component, uh, this AWG can multiplex the signal into one fiber, goes out to fibers. And the operational principle of this AWG is quite similar to the phase array antenna. And in phase array antenna, the phase front is manipulated by the electronically, uh, delaying this uh, phase uh, or this phase. But uh, in this AWG, the phase tilting is automatically provided by the wavelength itself. Okay, uh, next one is the Indian phosphide AWG. Uh, this is rather old data, uh, which is done by NTT, our laboratory in the past. And uh, Indian phosphide also, we can make uh, AWG and uh, the multiplexing properties, you see 64 channels. And the important uh, thing in AWG is the adjacent channel crosstalk. So these are back, background noise, uh, which is crosstalk to the other channels. And commercially, this should be more than 21 dB. So this one is rough. Even in the laboratory stage, this is not sufficient enough. But uh, uh, the company in Finera in US, uh, it's almost 15 years ago. Uh, it's about the startup 15 years ago, and currently it's uh, very successful. So it's a big company now. And they, that company only commercialized in Indian phosphide AWG. Uh, probably this is the transmitter side assembly, and this is the uh, receiver side assembly for telecom applications. I, I think they use 16 channel or 32 channel AWG with 100 or 200 gigahertz spacing. And uh, no other company has been successful, so uh, people don't know what is really goes on, but uh, only this company has been successful. And one key uh, importance is they introduced the quality control, factory quality control of Intel, so they hired Intel people and uh, established the, their factory uh, or quality control very well. So probably that's a key for the, that company's success. Okay, next is the architecture of data center. Anyway, as I described, the data center drives every market now and uh, in our market, in our field, the capacity increases uh, daily because of the data center requirement. And there are various kinds of uh, connections required, very short and long. And of course, uh, anyway, the signal goes out to the metro or 
long distance fiber optic network. And for the shorter region, still coaxial kappa is utilized. And for 10 meter range, active optical cable is utilized. I will describe later on. And for up to 100 or 200 meter, multi-mode fiber has been utilized. Or still, uh, majority of the fibers are multi-mode fibers in data center. But uh, in order to increase the capacity, single mode fiber has been introduced uh, maybe five years ago. That's why uh, people in the data center uh, utilize the AWG based transceivers. So our AWG, four channel AWG is used currently Amazon, Facebook, or Microsoft. <coughs> and soon Google will utilize our Silica AWG four-channel WDM uh, transceivers. OK. And uh, before using AWG, people used uh, interference filters. And uh, at 850 nanometer, still dominates. And this one is 1.3 microns. And it's a molded uh, uh, configuration. And for the demultiplexing case, four-channel signal comes in. And in this uh, interference filter, only lambda 2 passes. And rest of the signal uh, ref are reflected. And here, only lambda 1 uh, passing through. And this is the uh, operational principle of interference filter for uh, current WDM systems in data, mostly de uh, data center applications. And the coupling to multi-mode fibers, it's quite easy. Multi-mode fiber core radius is almost 50 micron diameter. So uh, even plus minus 5 micron uh, alignment error can be absorbed. But for if the uh, people use, start to use single mode fibers, the plus minus one micron error matters a lot. So uh, in that case, this kind of uh, bulk uh, uh, optics becomes very difficult. Uh, in other words, the fabrication yield becomes low and low. That's why people are interested in using uh, silica-based AWGs. OK, so in this view graph, I would like to explain what is AOC, active optical cable. In the past, there is a, a active kappa cable. So it's a kind of USB in, in optics. So everything is equipped in the uh, transceiver end and also connectorized with fiber, typically multi-board fibers in the past. So transmitters or receiver electronics and pixel uh, vertical cavity surface emitting lasers. This is quite compatible to multi-board fibers. And this has been used. Uh, there is no need for cleaning or splicing for data center. Data center is relatively not clean compared to telecom offices. So it's quite uh, advantageous for data centers. And this one is the uh, transceivers. Currently, uh, instead of big cell for single mode fibers, people use this uh, laser diode, for, for laser diodes. And uh, as I described, we cannot increase the number of channels in WDM systems. But uh, information traffic requirement increases day by day. So oh, people should catch up the uh, requirement anyway. So one possible way is similar to microwave systems. We should increase the uh, per lambda information capacity more and more. And Currently, at data center, people start to use uh, pulse amplitude modulation, PAM4. And currently, modulation uh, uh, signal modulation speed is almost limited by 25 uh, gigabit 
which is limited by CMOS electronics. So one channel can carry here 28, but 25 gigabit times four channel and in total 100 gigabit uh, data center transceiver transmission has been uh, achieved quite recently. But in future, the, a, a, everything should be scalable. Otherwise, people cannot use trans optics uh, transceivers. And one scalable way to increase the uh, channel capacity is to use the uh, pulse amplitude modulation. So uh, as you learned in the graduate school, oh, we have two amplitude and bottom represents zero, zero. So one amplitude represents two bit. So in, in total, we can double the capacity even using 25 gigabit. So we can transmit 50 gigabit per lambda and times four, 200 gigabit. Probably next year or two years later, it will be okay. But then three years later, it's not enough at all. So people should increase the parameter capacity from 25 gigabit to 50 gigabit. This is a quite new uh, topic which is reported this much at the optical fiber communication conference in US. So I, I described 25 is the limit currently, but people are now trying to moderate at 50 gigabit. Uh, by this case, uh, in the past, laser is directly driven by 25 gigabit, but it is not enough to directly drive from CMOS to laser diode. So in, in this experiment, they used external modulator, electroabsorption based modulator, up to 53 gigabit, gigabo. So precisely, bo rate is the basic uh, frequency rate which is available from electronics. And bit rate is what is really transmitted by using advanced modulation for format. So oh, people tried or oh, succeeded 50 gigabo. That means by using a PAM4, pulse amplitude modulation, they can transmit 100 gigabit times four channel. So 400 gigabit will be available maybe two years or three years later on in order to catch up the uh, requirement of uh, information increase. Okay, uh, uh, since I uh, collaborated with Tristan, uh, I checked several papers and this is Bristol University and also MIT. Iranian is a silicon uh, CMOS foundry which is established in the US. Uh, that is similar to IME here. And probably he likes very much silicon photonics so he put so many good mark for silicon and not so many for silicon or rest of the devices. So the greatest advantage of silicon photonics is uh, everything can be very compact, I will show later on. So that is the advantage, but uh, there are several other technical challenges I will discuss from now on. Okay, so I will compare the uh, AWG, taking the example of AWG, the size of circuit. This is the uh, telecom AWG. This is somewhat big, uh, 22 by 15 millimeter. And this one is the typical AWG, which is used for data center applications. But still, this is uh, somewhat bigger. Uh, and these are the conditions in order to achieve single mode condition. The important thing is the core and cladding refractive index or refractive index parameter capital delta. And also with this thickness uh, product should satisfy this number roughly. Otherwise, if uh, this value becomes bigger than, for example, one or two, 
uh, waveguide becomes multi-moded. And for indium phosphide AWG, uh, this cannot be so small, although they are using very high index uh, material. But the important thing is both core and cladding has very high uh, or large number. So this refractive index difference cannot be so large. That's why uh, the bending radius cannot be so small, and that determines the net uh, chip size, as you see here. But uh, for silicon AWG, uh, so in the proportional size, it's almost uh, invisible, very small. And that is because core is silicon, that is 3.5 uh, refractive index, and cladding is a silica, so huge refractive index difference. Then obeying this uh, principle, core should be very small, submicron. It should be submicron. And bending radius can be almost three microns. And this one is uh, uh, AWG I made in the past. In, in this case, I placed a distributed Bragg reflector around here. So light is reflected back and demultiplexed. So this is much more smaller than normal AWG configuration. And this kind of process is only possible uh, using CMOS process. So uh, this is a great advantage, making everything very small. That's a silicon photonics. <laughs> okay. And I, I will briefly describe the, uh, there are mainly three kinds of waveguides in silicon photonics. One is the so-called silicon wire. So the starting material is SOI, silicon on insulator uh, substrate, which is, of course, commercially available. And people use photo mask and etch down the uh, other uh, region, completely etch down to the buried oxide region. This is the silica, and here is the silicon. And as I described, it's a submicron core we should have in order to achieve single mode operation. And loss is typically one dB per centimeter, as I already described. And these are the simulated electric field uh, plot. You see, uh, electric density should be continuous. So electric field uh, cannot be continuous. So at the interface of refractive index change, we have very uh, uh, large electric field uh, discrepancies. And loss is, uh, as I repeated, 100 times larger. But uh, uh, bending radius is almost 1,000 times smaller compared to silicon or silica. So it's a great advantage. But uh, uh, bending radius itself does not determine the uh, device size. Device size is determined by uh, several other parameters or requirement. So typically MZI or AWG, the size is almost 50 or 100 times smaller in silicon anyway. So even if the dose is 100 times larger, I think uh, chip size is 100 times smaller. So loss does not matter. Loss, higher loss in silicon waveguide is not a serious problem. I, I think the problem or technical challenges are different. And the second one is the so-called deep waveguides. In deep waveguides, this region are not completely etched out. So this is mostly important for modulators. So for normal waveguides, uh, I asked the CMOS people in Japan uh, to make this deep waveguides, but uh, CMOS people does not like this kind of ambiguity. So we require to stop at certain point, certain thickness, but uh, they don't have accurate measurement apparatus to to measure the thickness, this, uh, 
this remaining sickness. So CMOS people does not like this kind of live waveguides in order to use for the passive waveguides, something like MZI or AWGs. But uh, if these WGH parameters satisfies this condition, these two conditions, this live waveguide can be single moded. So W can be very large, but if these three parameters satisfy this, these conditions, it can be single moded. So this is the advantage of silicon live waveguides. And the third one is so-called silicon slot waveguide. When we uh, cross each other, the silicon wire waveguides, a uh, typical gap is 100 nanometers, in this case, 125 nanometers. The, normally, the, uh, the uh, light field decays exponentially, but because of the requirement from Maxwell's equation, uh, you see here, even though this is air or silica cladding, electric field uh, enhances. So this is called slot waveguides. This, this is a simulation of electric field. So electric field is quite intensified here in the throat region. So this can be air, and in the air case, the electric field becomes so much intensified. But magnetic field obeys simple uh, law, and it is confined, of course, silicon region. So uh, overall pointing vector or power flow it's of course in the silicon region, power flow is confined in silicon region, but uh, uh, power in the silica uh, or air region can be intensified. So uh, people are interested in putting nanocrystal or organic material uh, for sensing applications. So this is a, a very interesting uh, uh, waveguide, I think, for many applications. Probably not telecom applications. Okay, so uh, I will quickly go through the rest of the slides. And uh, greatest advantage of silicon uh, material is uh, quite uh, low cost, cheap uh, modulator are available. And so here people use this PIN configuration and carrier accumulation type modulation has been almost commercialized. And uh, 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 carrier confinement or interaction between the carrier and optical field can be intensified and better than current lithium niobate based modulators, the better value has been obtained. So active uh, operation in silicon is quite advantageous uh, compared to Indian phosphide modulators because Indian phosphide crystal is a niche material and quite expensive compared to silicon industry. So this modulator is definitely an advantage of silicon photonics. And this one shows the uh, transceiver configuration of Raxtera, uh, which has commercialized the transceiver already. They have modulators and germanium uh, detectors on top of the silicon waveguide. And in this case, they cannot utilize WDM because silicon AWG cannot have good crosstalk better than minus 20 dB normal requirement. So people should use the uh, fiber space division multiplexing. Okay, so this is the cross section view of their configuration. They, they use just one laser diode and goes down to the silicon surface. Here they put a grating uh, inscribed on the surface of silicon waveguide. And almost normally light beam comes in and the grating reflects and the light beam can be trapped in the silicon waveguide. And here, one by four power split uh, is waiting. And silicon modulators modulate at 25 gigabit. And again, uh, grating 
couple signal into fibers. So there are four fibers, and this is parallel single mode of fiber four, PSM four. It, it, this is called PSM four. So silicon transceiver cannot so far utilize WDM because of the uh, technical challenges in making AWGs. So I will briefly describe the uh, fabrication error in silicon waveguides is roughly speaking uh, 10 or 100 times larger than silica. So that's the technical challenges currently. So or if there, there is a fabrication error in the core width or core thickness, that changes the uh, propagation constant. And also, of course, uh, it, it brings the phase error. So currently, the, this is the requirement for telecom or data com uh, WDM devices. The uh, crosstalk should be better than minus 20 dB in the uh, commercially available devices. And also, the uh, center of the channel are already uh, determined by the uh, uh, telecom standard. So we should align the uh, wavelengths of the uh, demultiplexer. And we measured the uh, center wavelengths of filter from chip to chip in one wafer or from wafer to wafer, so many chips. And we observed the uh, center wavelength variation is almost plus minus 0 0.01 nanometer in silica devices. And there is a, this row in AWG. M is a diffraction order, so it's a fixed number. And delta L is a, a pass length difference, so it's a fixed number. So when we measure the wavelength fluctuation, we know the how much the refractive index fluctuation. It's typically 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 5. So oh, here, let me call this is the local effective index fluctuation. It, it exists in the uh, wafer, throughout the wafer, or from wafer to wafer. We should have this kind of uh, refractive or effective index fluctuations caused by the fabrication error. And actually, this one is uh, for other purposes. Uh, we made an uh, array of cascade, uh, asymmetrical mach sender. In this case, 64 mach sender placed in parallel. And we measured the phase error distribution. Uh, so this offset was measured. That is delta phi k. And that represents the effective index fluctuation, uh, delta NC. And actually, the measured value is almost 10 to the minus fifth. So this is the typical value in silica waveguides. And this one is the uh, AWG demultiplexing properties. And typically, this is, the, of course, best value obtained in the laboratory in the past. But even commercial products, we normally get minus 30 dB crosstalk. So uh, in silica AWG, the performance is quite good. And my colleague in the past measured the phase error distribution in arrayed waveguides. And that was 10 to the minus 6. He used low coherence and Fourier transform spectroscopy method. So this should be correct. So I wondered why it is not 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 5. So probably what I will describe uh, will be correct. I'm not sure, but uh, uh, let me describe. Uh, so suppose we have several AWG chip in one wafer, typically 20 or 30 AWGs we have. And uh, center wavelengths, for example, are different from uh, chip to chip in one wafer or from wafer to wafer. Uh, because of the local effective index fluctuation, this blue line, that is 10 to the peak value is uh, 10 to the minus fifth, I suppose. But the uh, crosstalk is determined by the 
phase front fluctuation after passing through 100 array waveguides. So it's different from local effective index fluctuation. So theoretically, it is represented by the local effective index times the integration over this path, for example, in the else path. So it can be simply represented by the average effective index times the geometrical path. And this average value is the average of total path lengths. So generally speaking, it should be smaller than the local effective index. Uh, typically, that's 10 times smaller, I think. So that's the, oh, okay, represent this one. This is not the local effective index fluctuation. The average effective index fluctuation from waveguide to waveguide. That determines the, really determines the crosstalk of AWG. So there are complicated effects. But anyway, these are observed, measured results, and probably my explanation will hit the essence, I, I hope. But for silicon AWGs, uh, this is the uh, IMEC U University Ghent experiment. They made a silicon AWG, quite a compact AWG, but their fluctuation, wavelength fluctuation measured so many uh, AWGs from one uh, die. That was almost uh, one nanometer. Delta lambda was one nanometer, so almost 100 times larger. So in terms of delta n, local effective index fluctuation, 10 to the minus third, it's almost 100 times larger in silicon device. And for the uh, pass average effective index fluctuation has not measured, nobody measured in silicon photonics people. But uh, I suppose it's 10 to the minus fourth, again 100 times larger. And this representation is the empirical equation I got uh, after many simulations and also experimental data. Uh, I got this kind of representation to evaluate the crosstalk of AWG. And L center means the center of geometry. So this represents the typical uh, size of AWG or MZIs. And as I think, this one is the effective index fluctuation. Uh, this one in silicon is 100 times larger than silica, but this LCTR is roughly 10 times smaller, not 100 times smaller. If it is 100 times smaller, silicon AWG works quite well, but in practice, it is not, just 10 times smaller. So or net value in silicon device is 10 times larger. And if it is squared 20 dB worth, that's the reality of silicon AWGs or whatever device. When you make a symmetric max sender, the crosstalk is almost uh, 20 dB worth than um, made of silica. So oh, I make people or university Ghent people uh, wanted to improve the crosstalk. Uh, in the daily CMOS process at IMEC, I suppose, they used five nanometer grid, uh, e beam grid for making the mask. And that is five times smaller by using stepper. So in, in practice, one nanometer grid is the uh, theoretical irregularity. But anyway, after heating process, it is somewhat smoothed out. But I make people thought this is the origin of bad crosstalk in silicon wire AWGs. And they utilized one nanometer grid. So it should be very experiment uh, uh, research, I suppose. And one fifth sh shrinked. So grid uh, size in this case was 0.2 nanometer. And theoretically, they expected 12 dB crosstalk improvement if the crosstalk solely comes from this grid size, grid irregularity. 
But in practice, what they got is uh, just 5 dB improvement. So this is not the really the uh, true origin of the crosstalk. So, okay, so I, I will take other example. This one is the silicon or silica asymmetrical mark sender interferometers, for example, to make a four channel WDM multiplexer, demultiplexer. And instead of standard directional couplers, we use uh, this is called a zero gap coupler. And uh, this is more fabrication tolerant, even in silica waveguides. So I used this configuration for twist and circuit. And so I will show the theoretical simulation uh, for lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, lambda 4. So even and all the channels are separated by one A AMZI. And if we cascade uh, second uh, AMZI, we can separate lambda 1, lambda 3, or lambda 2, lambda 4. That's the operational principle. And if we make if we implement this circuit in silica, the phase delay error is typically 0 0.01 because of the uh, local effective index fluctuations. But in silica, or oh, sorry, silicon, it will be, of course, size becomes very small, but not 100 times smaller. So uh, 10 times large phase error you should have in the current CMOS technology. Of course, uh, people have not utilized the most advanced CMOS technique because CMOS people does not allow photonics people to utilize the best advanced CMOS process. It should be very expensive. So what we can utilize even in IME, I think the uh, one or two generation older process, I suppose. So what really matters is the uh, core thickness or width fluctuation. This one is a measured result for core width fluctuation. That is, RMS value is typically one nanometer observed by Glasgow University in the past. And I will show this equation later on, but anyway, Effective index fluctuation divided by unit uh, virus fluctuation is this order. So net fluctuation is 10 to the minus third. And this is the 300 millimeter SOI wafer uh, thickness, silicon thickness uniformity measured at uh, uh, here, I think, uh, AIST in Japan. I borrowed uh, their uh, uh, figure. So the, in this region, the overall fluctuation to sigma value is 0 0.6 nanometer. This is already surprising value. This is a one nanometer fluctuation obtainable. But still, uh, theory explains it is not enough. Uh, that brings two times 10 to the minus third. So, Oh, we should have sub-nanometer sub thickness or core with fluctuations. That is almost a silicon lattice constant. It's, of course, not possible. So I think this is a technical challenge for silicon photonics, especially passive devices. So I will briefly describe the, uh, simply a theoretical calculation for silica, typically silica indium phosphide and silicon deep these are parameters and silicon wire. This is the fundamental mode, dispersion curve, and this is the second mode. So the core width, for example, should be somewhere around here. Otherwise, waveguide becomes multi-boded. And this red line is a differential value with respect to core widths. So this is very important. Okay, and I already showed uh, this value for silicon wire. And for silica, it's quite small, 10 to the minus seventh. But uh, what really determines the f index fluctuation is the 
uh, how, what kind of lithography we, we use. Of course, CMOS uh, people can utilize very fine uh, lithography, even uh, one or two generation old um, uh, apparatus. So one nanometer I used, and those are the typical value for uh, silicon wire waveguides with respect to core with fluctuation. In our silica AWG or silica uh, device, we cannot use one nanometer lithography, definitely, because it's very expensive. So normally we use 25 uh, nanometer EBIM grid when we ask company to make a mask. So uh, multiplied by 25, it's reasonably agrees with measurement result, 10 to the minus fifth. And also, much more important is uh, thickness fluctuation, because many people utilize very thin silicon wire or indium phosphide. So most people uh, uh, focus on the core width fluctuation. But what really matters is the core thickness fluctuation. So it is already determined from the uh, substrate company or for SOI case, uh, DETI or CNETS in Japan makes SOI wafer. So uh, SOI thickness uniformity is already determined by I, 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 I,